Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is uh, Laurent Bechler. As uh, Marie-France probably told you, I am the director of one of uh, CIF's master programs. And uh, I would like to thank Marie-France for inviting me to be part of this uh, summer program. Though I cannot thank her for giving me the task to explain to you the European Union climate policy, I will try to do the following uh, in the coming hour. First, to explain why European countries are responsible for acting against climate change. Then, uh, why the EU is considered as a role model in this fight against climate change. I will give you some information about the uh, EU climate change strategy, uh, who has uh, recently evolved because in July 14, some key decisions were taken at the level of the European Commission. And then uh, some examples of the main challenges that the EU is facing while implementing this uh, strategy. So this is the amount of uh, emissions for 2017. And uh, you see that China is by far the biggest uh, carbon emitters, 27% 20, uh, at that time. Uh, then the US, 15%, and EU28, uh, less than 10% uh, carbon emissions. With the Brexit, it makes uh, even uh, less than that. So um, uh, the situation is that um, the biggest emissions come from emerging developing countries. But what really counts in terms of climate responsibility is past emissions. Broadly speaking, climate change comes from uh, emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, as you know. And um, uh, this um, accumulated amount of greenhouse gases amplify the natural greenhouse effects uh, warming the uh, earth surface temperature. And what creates this uh, greenhouse effect is already uh, past accumulated greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So what counts is the level of concentration of these greenhouse gases in the, in, in, uh, in the atmosphere, S uh, which is the result of past emissions that started, broadly speaking, with the Industrial Revolution some two and a half centuries ago. Now I come to the topic of uh, EU leadership, why the EU is often considered as a role model when it comes to fighting against climate change. You have a first uh, hint here by looking at the recent trajectories of carbon emissions in different parts of the world. You see that uh, without uh, surprise, Chinese emissions have started to accelerate in the 90s and they keep on uh, increasing recently. Same for another uh, fast emerging country like India. And it's not extremely clear uh, on the slide. It will become clearer with the coming slides, but here you can notice that the EU has reached a peak in carbon emissions in 1990 because from this uh, date onwards, carbon emissions by the EU have decreased. Slightly, but they have decreased, which is not the case for the US. The US, they have increased up until this date, so around 2005. Um, and it's not the case for uh, either Russia or Japan. And this is why Europe is considered as a leader in terms of uh, fighting against climate change. And you can see that from another perspective, which is the per capita emission uh, level, uh, carbon emission. You look at the bottom graph here showing energy related carbon emissions per capita. 
depending on the level of GDP per capita, standard of living. And we are in 2030. And we can compare here different parts of the world, different regions, different countries. And here again, you see how European countries, the European Union is uh, efficient in terms of uh, uh, curbing climate change because on a per capita basis, the level of carbon emission is much lower compared to what it is in the US. That was true in 1971, the diamond here. That was true in 2013. And that will be true uh, in the projected scenario for 2030. In fact, broadly speaking, twice as uh, less carbon emissions on a per capita basis in Europe compared to uh, what we observe in the US at these different dates. Um, so again, this is uh, a way to observe how efficient the European Union is in terms of uh, controlling carbon emissions. And you can observe the same thing by comparing the European Union to China at uh, this specific date, 2013, you see that the level of carbon emissions in China and in the European Union was approximately the, the same. But of course, the level of economic activity, standards of living, GDP is much bigger, much higher in the European Union compared to what it is in China, which means that for the same level of carbon emission, the same environmental impact, you have a much higher um, economic performance in the European Union compared to China. Another way to say that China, uh, Europe is much more efficient and uh, much um, better at uh, curbing environmental impacts and climate impacts of its economic activities compared to a country, in a fast emerging country like China. The last way to assess this uh, climate leadership in Europe is to look at what European countries achieved under the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol was the first uh, international treaty dealing with climate change. It was uh, signed in 1997, entered into force in 2005 and uh, was a uh, completed in uh, 2012 compared to the level of 1990s spain had the opportunity to let its uh, carbon emission increase by 15 percent france uh, had to stabilize its carbon emissions under the same period and the country like germany um, had the target of diminishing carbon emissions by 21 percent during this period of 22 years okay and the blue bars are what countries did in the end so what was observed uh, after the implementation period of the Kyoto protocol you see here that countries like uh, New Zealand Canada uh, Australia or the US did very bad because uh, they could not achieve uh, the uh, target set under the Kyoto Protocol. For example, New Zealand had a more than 60% uh, increase in its carbon emissions compared to the target of 0% increase. Canada was supposed to decrease its carbon emissions by 6%, but let it increase by almost 45%. And finally, the US uh, had to decrease the emissions by 7%, but finally had an increase uh, by close to 10%. So I will not go into the details of why these countries fail in uh, dealing with uh, their carbon targets, but I would like you to pay attention to how European Union countries did under the Kyoto Protocol. France did uh, good, 0% target, but finally minus almost 7-8%. And look at all these uh, 
uh, Eastern European countries, uh, not all of them being uh, EU countries, of course, but if you look at Poland, uh, Estonia, Bulgaria, Romania, you see that they did much better compared to their Kyoto target. Of course, uh, there is a big explanation behind this level of performance as a very simple explanation, which is that the basis year for the Kyoto Protocol, as you see here, is 1990. And in 1990, we had, of course, the fall of the Soviet empire, and this led to a huge process of industrial and agricultural restructuration in this part of Europe, in these countries, uh, Eastern European countries. And this process of uh, industrial and agricultural restructuration led mechanically to an enormous fall of carbon emissions in this part of uh, Europe. What is the EU climate um, strategy? Again, uh, since um, I do not have much time to go into the details, I need to focus on the most important aspect of this uh, strategy. Simply speaking, the EU is the most ambitious actor in terms of uh, setting climate objectives. Recently, uh, on July 14, these objectives were reassessed and it has been um, agreed at EU level that the new objective for 2030 would be a decrease in greenhouse gases emissions by 50% by 2030 compared to 1990, which is still the uh, this year. Um, as previously, the target was minus 40%. So this is a big increase, 15 uh, uh, percentage points for this target. And uh, when it comes to the um, renewables part in the global energy mix of the EU, uh, the uh, target for 2030 is 40%. As you probably know, the EU um, has pledged to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Uh, climate neutral means that uh, regarding all greenhouse gases emissions, um, all additional emissions of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere must be compensated, must be set off by something else in order to uh, stabilize uh, the uh, global climate, um, which means that the EU, as a matter of fact, will become climate uh, neutral by 2050. This implies that um, greenhouse gases emissions and carbon emissions must decrease by a level which uh, will be between 90, 80 and 95% by 2050. This is an absolutely uh, enormously ambitious objective. I will come back to that in some uh, minutes. And the last thing that uh, has been adopted recently after uh, harsh discussions is a carbon border adjustment tax which is a way to it, it, the the the, uh, the objective of this tax is um, uh, is in fact uh, double first this is to uh, incentivize external actors non european countries to um, contribute to climate efforts. Uh, the EU has decided to ad adopt this carbon border adjustment tax, which uh, will be, in fact, a tax on imported country, uh, imported goods from uh, foreign countries according to their carbon content. Not all goods, some specific goods. Again, I don't want to go into the detail, but the idea, for the speaking, is um, to incentivize external actors by uh, making their goods um, more pricey when they come into the EU uh, internal market. 
The other objective is to protect uh, European producers from external uh, competitors who do not have as for who are not um, impacted by as uh, ambitious and stringent climate policies in their own countries. How um, does the EU intend to reach this major goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050? There are in fact three ways to do that. One is to decarbonize the uh, power production sector, because this is here that uh, half of uh, carbon emissions come from. And then you have the other activities which cannot be electrified, or at least uh, that cannot be electrified in a cost effective uh, way. You find many of these activities in the heavy industrial sectors. Um, you find uh, such activities also in the uh, transportation sector, like uh, air transportation or truck uh, transportation. It's difficult to electrify uh, these sectors according to our uh, current technologies and know-how. Um, so in these sectors, we have other ways to decarbonize. One of these ways is to use carbon capture storage technology. These are technologies by which uh, while you emit carbon by burning fossil fuels in these uh, industrial or transportation sectors, you avoid uh, emitting uh, carbon into the atmosphere by capturing uh, these um, uh, carbon molecules and store them underground by, uh, by technologies which already exist, which are available. They are costly, but they can be used in these sectors in order to avoid additional carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Another way, there is a long list of uh, ways to uh, try to decarbonize these, uh, these activities, these sectors. Something else that we need to do in order to uh, decarbonize the EU economy and to reach this carbon neutral target for 2050 is to accelerate energy uh, productivity improvements in many kind of uh, sectors and activity because at the moment we, we waste a lot of energy, uh, not only in Europe, of course, but um, but in Europe as well, we waste a lot of energy in uh, different activities like insulating buildings. Uh, energy losses in this instance are estimated at 30, 35, at some points 40 percent, which is enormous. And so we need to invest a lot of um, um, resources in order to avoid these losses by, for example, retrofitting buildings, commercial or um, residential buildings, in order to increase the level of uh, insulation. How do we uh, implement um, changes in order to decarbonize the power production sector, decarbonize uh, activities that cannot be cost, uh, electric, uh, cost effectively electrified, or in order to uh, save energy resources, we uh, can do that by mostly two uh, ways. The one is to spend a lot of money in different kinds of infrastructures. Because uh, changing the way we produce or consume goods in order to decrease uh, the uh, energy content and the carbon content of energy used to produce and to consume these goods um, will rely on enormous amounts of investments of different kinds. Here you have an estimate of how costly that can be. Uh, 28 trillion euros, so 28,000 billion euros over the next uh, 
three decades in order to become climate neutral by 2050. This is an enormous amount of money, currently accounting for 4% of uh, EU GDP. So this is a big, a really big amount of uh, uh, financial capacity or 25% of yearly capital investments at the EU level, uh, even more impressive uh, figure probably. According to some uh, scenarios, to some estimates, if we could uh, reorientate 75% of these investments going to the fossil fuel sector, uh, that could make a big contribution to uh, this financial effort. The second uh, way is to set a price on carbon emissions. Uh, this is a fundamental uh, problem. The fact is that um, all kinds of actors, including you and me, emit uh, carbon into the atmosphere or greenhouse gases into the atmosphere on a daily basis uh, without paying attention to what we do because Basically, we do that freely, freely without incurring any kind of cost while doing that. This is what economists call a negative externality. And this is a situation that can be curbed uh, only by setting a price on these carbon emissions. Um, how do we set the price on carbon emissions in order to um, change behaviors of uh, actors uh, contributing to these uh, carbon emissions. We can do that either by putting a tax on carbon emissions, so an additional price, um, or by uh, setting a cap and trade system. And the EU, another way to illustrate the fact that the EU is a leader in uh, climate uh, uh, change strategies, the EU was the first uh, region to implement an international cap and trade system in 2005. First, it covers 50% of EU emissions. Of course, once you have decided a uh, cap, you need to, if, you, if the, the, the objective is really to become carbon neutral, you need to decrease carbon emissions year on year. And in order to do that, you need to decrease the cap itself. This is what the EU ETS is doing. Up until 2020, uh, the cap um, was decreasing by this 1.74% uh, level a year. And uh, starting in 2020, um, the restriction is even bigger because year on year, the cap will have to decrease by 2.2%. At the moment, um, most uh, allowances or carbon permits, as we call them, are auctioned, which means that they are sold on a market um, uh, to the uh, uh, firms uh, wanting to buy them. And the rest is uh, distributed freely mainly according to competitiveness issues to distribute freely these allowances in order not to impact too much the competitiveness of some specific industrial actors. The main ways by which this system can be made uh, more efficient are to um, make the cap more constraining because for some observers, even this 2.2% um, uh, level of uh, additional stringency uh, is not uh, is not enough for becoming a carbon neutral by 2050. Another obvious way by which you can make uh, this system more efficient is to extend the coverage because 50% of course is not uh, completely satisfactory. So, for example, in the coming years, there is a project to extend the system to the maritime sector as uh, previously it was uh, extended to the uh, aviation sector by uh, 2012. Uh, something else that can be done is to end the free distribution of uh, allowances because this is uh, the best way by which 
uh, you will orientate uh, available permits to the most efficient uh, firms from a um, carbon curving point of view. So these uh, are different um, uh, path for, uh, forward in order to make the EU strategy and the EU ETS system more efficient in coming years. Uh, on this slide, you have the carbon price uh, observed on this um, EU ETF because, of course, once you have uh, created this um, carbon market, artificially, in fact, by setting a cap and make, making it possible to exchange allowances on this uh, newly created market, you um, um, at the same time, you uh, create a situation in which suppliers of permits and demanders of these uh, carbon permits can uh, meet on this newly created market. And when you have a supply and a demand of something on the market, you uh, you have a price at the same time. And what you observe on this slide is the wide fluctuations of the uh, carbon permit price on this EU market starting in 2005. And you see that at some points, the price went so low that it was uh, zero, for example, in 2007, 2008. And this is uh, typically what happens when the system is not ambitious enough. So for example, in this period, 2007, 8, the problem was that too many allowances were distributed to um, these uh, 11,000 uh, industrial actors involved by the system. According to most uh, economic studies, this level must be at uh, least uh, 40 euros a ton in order to have a well-functioning system. We were far from this level in 2013 or 2017 for different reasons I cannot uh, explain now because of lack of time. Another illustration uh, of how or why it will become difficult to, to become climate neutral in the three coming decades is by looking at what the EU did over uh, the uh, recent period. I told you about the Kyoto Protocol and about the uh, EU performance under this Kyoto Protocol. But what is interesting is to observe um, how the EU countries were able to decrease their carbon or greenhouse gases emissions over uh, two different um, uh, periods of implementation of the Kyoto Protocol. And this is what we can do uh, here. We see that um, for these uh, countries, Germany, UK, uh, Poland, or Czech Republic, the level of um, greenhouse gases uh, emission reduction was uh, much bigger during this uh, decade, the 90s, as compared to what it was during the second decade of uh, 2000. This is true for Germany, this is true for the UK, Poland and Czech Republic, and as a result, for the EU uh, 27. Why is it so? For different reasons, but mainly because of what I already told you about the fall of the Soviet empire. During this uh, 1990 decade, these countries, Poland and Czech Republic, but Germany also, thanks to the uh, German reunification process, these countries benefited from the uh, industrial and agricultural restructuration process that led to this enormous uh, 
decrease of carbon emissions, mechanical, I would say, decrease of carbon emissions in this part of uh, Europe, the East European countries. For the EU, uh, UK case, the situation is different. This is because in the UK, there was a reorientation of the uh, power production uh, sector, uh, switching from coal-based uh, power plants to gas power plants. And gas being much less carbon intensive compared to coal, it uh, led to a huge uh, decrease of carbon emissions in the UK economy. But that was not uh, um, linked to any kind of climate uh, strategy. That was simply because gas uh, started to become cheaper compared to coal during this decade. And so from a purely economic point of view, that was much more um, uh, economical for UK power plants to switch from coal to gas. So this decade was a, um, um, a decade of high um, climate performance because of non-climate related strategies observed in EU countries. And you see that once these uh, low hanging fruits were um, uh, picked up by European countries, it became much more difficult to decrease carbon emissions in uh, the year 2000 decades. And it means that in fact, um, uh, reaching the uh, global targets of becoming climate neutral and decreasing global uh, uh, greenhouse gases emissions or carbon emissions, emissions by something between 80 or 95% over the coming three decades will be extremely difficult and as a final illustration of that, uh, you can look at this graph, which is extracted from an uh, extremely uh, useful website, which is called Climate Action Tracker. This is a website where a climate uh, specialists track um, climate performances of all countries in the world. So what they do is that they compare uh, what these countries have pledged to do under the Paris Agreement, which is, as you know, the uh, um, currently operating international treaty to deal with uh, climate strategies and climate targets at world level. And so they compare the um, pledges of countries under the Paris Agreement to what they uh, really do and to what they should do in order to be in line with the final global targets of uh, limiting global warming to two Celsius degree, or uh, in the best case scenario, 1.5 Celsius degree. Um, so the a level of uh, long-term stabilization of global warming at world level. So uh, the last point and my last word on that, and uh, sorry to be a bit uh, pessimistic, you need to remember that uh, the climate uh, challenge is a global challenge. So as I already told you, even if the EU is perfectly efficient in uh, fighting against climate change, if other actors do not do the same kind of efforts, uh, the uh, environmental impact of the EU climate strategy will fall to almost nothing. And um, unfortunately, if we look at what countries do or even pledge to do under the Paris Agreement, we are still quite far from the target set uh, under this agreement. These are the two carbon emission fast ways to be in line with the uh, Paris Agreement commitments, either 1.5 Celsius degree global warming or two Celsius degree global warming. Um, we are far from that because currently, even considering current pledges and targets set by countries having signed and ratified the Paris Agreement, we are on a um, trajectory for a 2.5 to 2.8 Celsius degree global warming by the end of this century. This, this is if countries really do what they pledged they would do. But given current policies, uh, we are more like 
on a strategy for a close to three Celsius degree global warming. And of course, uh, if uh, things really go uh, worth and if countries um, abandon their strategy, we will, of course, incur a, a, a larger uh, global warming. But now we are, globally speaking, on a path for uh, three Celsius degree global warming with catastrophic climate impacts like, like the one we are uh, recently observing in terms of um, uh, extreme weather events in North America or in uh, Europe with uh, big heat waves or big uh, flooding. So, um, um, of course, it's interesting to look at what the EU is doing in terms of um, climate change policy, but it's not enough. We need to take the uh, global look at what other actors like China and the US do in this instance. And when we look at that, we see unfortunately that we are quite far from what should be done in order to, to be in line with the uh, Paris Agreement target. 